Welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Sayed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Bayt. Tonight we're joined by the wonderful Dr. Chinmay Pandya, Pro Vice Chancellor of the DSVV University in India and grandson of Pandit Sriram Sharma Acharya, founder of the All World Gayatri Pariwa Fraternity, which itself has 100 million members and thousands of global centres dedicated to social reform. In this episode, we interrogate increasingly strained Muslim Hindu relations in India and the scope for interfaith rapprochement there, the complex interplay between faith and mental health. And finally, the holistic philosophy of the All World Gayatri Pariwa Fraternity. Dr. Pandya, it's wonderful to have you here on what is now the fourth episode of World of Faith. And to start, I wanted to ask you about your grandfather, the Pandit Acharya, who founded the All World Gayatri Pariwa Fraternity, in his own words, as a living model guided by principles of human unity, of equality. In your capacity as a pro vice chancellor of the DSVV University in India, which is a university whose education strives to encompass these values of the all world Gayatri Pariwa fraternity, could you perhaps explain for us what the philosophy of the Gayatri Pariwa fraternity is, and then perhaps ground our understanding of where the fraternity lies in the religious spiritual fabric of India? Thank you, Michael. It's a great privilege to be on your podcast and also uh, such a delight to be here along with Imam, for whom I have got the greatest respect and uh, he is like a brother to me. And he had his birthday on 22nd of uh, this, this month. So again, many congratulations to him. So um, wonderful question that you asked. And uh, I believe that you know, before we start to talk about the ethos and of fraternity. Uh, and its impact upon the religion and the spiritual horizon of India and possibly the West also. I think it would be wise to share a few words about Gurudev, who I was blessed to be connected uh, with as my grandfather. Because knowing a little bit about him would allow your audience to better acquaint with the vision uh, behind this colossal establishment that we call as the Gayatri Parivar, which now has more than 120 million members all over the world and thousands of centers of uh, global reform and self embellishment So in his lifetime, uh, Gurudev, uh, he was respected as a great visionary. Uh, many people may call him as a prophet also because the last 40 books that he wrote, uh, they were actually uh, creating the vision that along the lines on which the humanity should uh, live. And he was also a prolific scholar, uh, wrote more than 3,400 books. We recently digitized his literature and 3,397 have been uh, already digitized and 94 are left to be uploaded. So he was a groundbreaking scholar, a powerful orator, uh, a saint, seer. What, what, what makes him special in my opinion is that in spite of all those accolades, he was the most simple and humane person. If anyone would approach him, I used to be very young, like in four years, five years old. So I would go near to him, but I would feel very special, like, you know, coming next to him. And try imagining a person who for 42 years of his life was in absolute solitude. So he was in Himalayas. And remaining 38 years, he wrote everything that I talked about. He created this huge organization and, and lived very simply. So his simplicity, his generosity, which made many people treat him like their own father, that was the reason behind the establishment of this huge uh, organization, institution, which practiced on one simple thing that in Hindi we call as the Sada Jeevanuchu, which are live simply but think highly. And to help you to understand the place of its philosophy in the wider horizon, because that is slightly unique. Uh, as it is more spiritually, spirituality oriented as compared to uh, religiously oriented. And for us to understand, uh, 
let us try to evaluate the current circumstances in which we are currently passing through and and when like you know nothing could be a greater example than the current times because what we see emerging at that level is a scene of uh, chaos and conflict and, and disillusionment and fear there is a fear of escalating tension between nations we already recently had a tension between india and china in addition to that we have multiple other fears there is a fear of like you know apocalyptic end to the mankind we are passing through global pandemic at the moment but besides all these reasons like you know we as faith leaders are most afraid of is people losing faith in themselves faith in humanity and no matter where we go and, and to whom we ask the simple questions of the life are proving to be most difficult to answer are we genuinely happy are we truly satisfied do we really have the life as we pretend over the facebook and maybe like you know for some people it may be true that they really have the best kind of life but the for most of the people it's not there the pain the suffering the sorrow the stress the strife the tension that is inside the human beings was not even there in the battlefield of the last century and this world like what they've said demands a change if everything continues the way it is then we would be leaving a damaged world and a fractured society for the next generation families would be gone individuality would be gone and humanity would be dead and and for that purpose he created or he envisioned shanti kunj to exist as a prototype like you know not not as a utopia but like a prototype where people can come take inspiration and, and return and create the same place in their own capacity so it's imagine like you know we have 500 acre campus and 25000 people can live here but it's absolutely free there is not a single penny charge like you know 18000 people eat for free every day thousands of people from any race religion caste creed they come every day and and he created this uh, on two simple philosophies self embellishment and social upliftment uh, making myself a good human being and making society a good place to live so he embraced the good from everywhere from every kind of like you know philosophy or every kind of faith school because he wanted to create this place and a place for humanity if we want to find an equivalent model to this augustine kind of model then uh, that we can find in the rishi tradition of india where rishis were called the like you know enlightened and accomplished individuals who gave their life for the betterment of humanity so this is the place that he created with that kind of philosophy where people can come take inspiration everything is free and like the message he left at the central temple he said uh, everyone is welcome like mother welcomes people home sadhu shraddha prakhar pragya means return to the parvar so two messages he left there and he said whatever you do like you know go from here with the uh, with the message for humanity so this was the idea for this place to be created I hope that makes sense. You know, very much so. And I wanted to actually pick up on the dual principles of self embellishment and social uplifting, because the fraternity's philosophy does call for restraint and wisdom in private matters, but seems to be very outwardly active in that it encourages the fervent pursuit of equity, as you yourself described. So Pandit Acharya himself was an ardent social reformer, an advocate for India's independence. the dsvv university states its aim as a consciousness based education which requires of its students a cultivation of environmental responsibility the combat of corruption organized relief efforts for those in need so i wonder first if you could touch on what it means to have that consciousness based education within that dual ethic that you mentioned of self embellishment and social uplifting and then perhaps more saliently to talk about how that ties into your understanding of interfaith relations how does this philosophy for example position our obligation to help oppressed muslim communities in the wake of the delhi riots which has obviously been a very critical juncture in india's recent internal ethnocentric tensions to answer that i think i would um, prefer to share a story so like you know the, there is a temple they are living in and there is a very beautiful story behind the creation of that temple so long time ago when my grandfather had finished 24 years of penance so he was living on barely nothing and he was constantly purifying himself and that time uh, one of the richest men of india 
like equivalent to Bill Gates, uh, Mr. Birla, he came. And he came and, and, and he wanted to give like, you know, billions of rupees to him so that he can create the most beautiful temple. So he wanted to give it to him. And, and what they've said, like, you know, my grandfather said, he said, uh, why do you want to give it to me? And, and because he never used to accept the donation. He never used to take the money. He said that I'm not going to take it from you. But tell me, what do you want to, for, for this money to do? And he said, well, like, you know, to make a gold temple. So he said, what's the point of a gold temple to be created if people don't have food outside? He said, why don't you make a school or a, or a like, you know, college or a university? They are the temples. He said, if I have to make a temple, I will make people running temple. God should be in the heart of the people. You meet them and you feel like you met the divinity. So that's the goal he wanted to have. Like, you know, it was not a place of worship that he wanted to create. He wanted everyone to be a running temple. Like, you know, you go and meet them and you feel like, you know, the uh, principles of religion or the spirituality alive in them. And also, like, you know, if, if we take, if we think about the situation, like you were mentioning from a very different perspective, then uh, I remember a Sanskrit saying, uh, which if I translate, it means that never measure a distance that you have covered individually, but look for the one that you have covered together. For when we look at the collective travel of the mankind, when we look at our journeys together, what we unfortunately find that most of the pages of history books are soaked in the cascade of work and then doing the name of religion. And this question is as relevant as it is in, in India, as it is probably you're sitting in Australia. Or, or my friend is sitting in England. It's relevant everywhere that how could we allow the religion, which is such a profound experience for humanity, to get poisoned with hatred and aggression and intolerance. And, and this he called as a calamity of consciousness. And he preferred the word consciousness because when we see this kind of narrow mindedness that he, he talked about, and everyone is aware of it and everyone wants to change it. However, when we try to look for the solution, our efforts are focused only on the external methods. We want to change the law, we want to change the regulation, we want to change our practices, which are important and, and they are very important, but they cannot solely bring an appreciable change unless there is a change in the way we think and address these issues, unless we change the mindset of the people. That's why he called it the uh, the movement that he created, he called it the thought transformation movement. He says, change the way you think. Because he said, the, the, these crises of the human conscience that allow people to continue living their lives, like nothing is happening. When so many people are like dying and, and like you know, human humanity is struggling to find its feet. It demands a fundamental change in the global mindset and consciousness. And, and this change happens only if we change the substance of the individual, not from outside. Like you know, if I change my um, clothes or if I dye my hair or I get to do, it does not change me as a person. And unless we change as a person, unless we change as a personality, we cannot create like you know uh, a situation where different fibers of different faith can create one fabric of humanity. And that's what he wanted to create. Like you know. He always gave the example of Ekta, Samata, Shuchita, Mamta. Ekta means unity. Samta means like you know, equality. Shuchita means sacredness. And Mamta means compassion. He, 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 he said these are the cornerstones of humanity. So he created the ashram that we have. If you come here and you are most, more than welcome to come here, you will find these four things written on the four pillars when you come inside. He said these are the foundation of humanity. And he, he took them from the ancient scriptures of India, where there comes a very beautiful line, and it says, I am Nijaha Paroveti, Kadana Lagu Chetasa, Udara Charita Nam To Sudhaiv Kukulla. I am this Nijah mind, Paroveti, your. So this is mine, that is yours. He said this kind of feeling can only be for the, the small people. But those people who are matured or who represent a like, you know, bigger philosophy, Sudhaiv Kukulla. Entire planet is one single family, and mm. those who have got love and respect for each other, for them, the whole world is nothing but a big family. That's why he called our organization. If you read Gayatri Parivar, so Parivar means family, mm. and he created a family for everyone. 
so in these are uncertain times when we have got the covid situation what else could be a better thing like you know we have to fight this misfortune together together as humanity together as one species together as one race together as one family together as one civilization because the entire humanity is in crisis many people like you know who lost their lives and so many people who lost their loved ones and another if we can do something for them like you, know, you sitting in australia uh, imam sitting in india and we all can come together so these are our goals like you know people who are suffering if we can do something for them if we can make them happy if we can wipe off their tears then what else do we need like mm. we have got a very beautiful saying in in hindi and it says like you know par hit saras dharm nahi bhai par peeda na se madhuma that to help the other person in need there is no other definition of religion that's you the know, religion I, I, we believe I really like that and i think particularly this divide that you mentioned between what is exoteric about religion about expression in the form of garbs expression in the form of practice versus what's intrinsic on the principled level of religion and what as you mentioned binds different faiths to form one social fabric and to the imam i wanted to engage you in this same part of the conversation about how shiism might treat a more spiritual philosophy like that espoused by the gayatri pariwa fraternity and the scope of engagement in interfaith relations outside of the abrahamic religions because maybe ostensibly it seems that there are only exoteric divides between different religions but when you're breaching this monotheistic divide that occurs between the abrahamic religions and religions which are more spiritually foundational or have many gods i was wondering how you see this space for interfaith dialogue manifesting when there seems to be such an immediate theological block there well i think it's a very important question that you raised and i'd like to thank dr pandya for an amazing and thought provoking couple of minutes where he's really encapsulated a great wisdom a great philosophy and that's what a wise man does there's a difference between a scholar and a wise man a scholar can write and write and write but a wise man takes thousands of pages and puts it into a sentence so it's been very very advantageous i believe for all of us who have been listening to dr pandya um coming to your question you see shiism itself was founded as more of a spiritual um essence within islam so when you look at all of the sufi movements in islam the leaders of all of those sufi movements essentially go back to one individual and that individual is imam ali who is the first shia imam so shiaism in its core is actually a spiritual movement in its core it goes towards connection with the divine and as imam ali said he said look islam is really two things it's twofold your duty to god and your duty to humanity in respect to your duty to god it's really your connection your prayers with god so your spiritual refinement your movement your spiritual wayfaring that's your connection with god hmm. but to get to that also the second part is your duty to humanity and this is why when the quran talks it says o oh mankind so you may have noticed if you open the quran unlike many muslims today who actually don't read the quran if they were to read it just open it and see it actually addresses humanity adam is the first human but he's also humanity and so therefore the polish of the entire universe the jewel and the crown of god you could say the greatest manifestation of the image or the face of god is humanity and so therefore when humanity comes together that is the only time you see progress made you know people talk about this era being one of a pandemic and something which we've never seen before unprecedented well actually pandemics have come and gone over the centuries but i guess the unprecedented nature is the fact that it's affected all of us and because it's affected humanity only humanity together can overcome this so i believe and this is something that our faith teaches us is that we have to go beyond just the different colors and the languages because in essence 
really we're going towards, towards one location. It's really about one essence. And, and again, the reason why we have multiplicity is because these, this multiplicity are the images of God. God is diverse. You know, this absolute being, to understand this absolute being requires you to have different colors and different languages. And the greats all over the world, if you notice, in thousands of years, they teach one message. And I think India is quite a sum of that message. You know, if you go today and if you look at all the greats that have come in India, be they Moinuddin Cheshti or anyone else, you know, from all the different, that's the Muslims. And then you look at Dr. Chinmay's grandfather and you look at the gurus who came in Sikhism. Maybe the titling is different, but the essence is the same. There's, there's one movement and that's one humanity. So if now that you ask me the question, what about interfaith? When already the Quran tells me, oh, humanity, then we have a responsibility. And let me tell you something. If you go back 400 or 500 years ago, in the time of the Safavis, actually there was a movement of Shia philosophers and thinkers and mystics who came to India and actually started discussions on the Vedas. We have translation of the Bhagavad Gita, for example, in Persian 500 years ago, mm -hmm. 450 years ago. Right. So in the time of the school of Isfahan, the school of Isfahan were famous for being mystics. They traveled to India, they engaged and they converted, or you could say translated much of the knowledge in India and they brought it back to Iran. And today, even if you go to Lucknow as a city in some of the heartlands of, you could say Shiism's Shia's heartland in India is Lucknow or Hyderabad the modern the modern day heartland for Shia intellectual studies, Hyderabad or Lucknow. Before it was Allahabad, Jampur, and even Sirinagar. And if you go there to those libraries, you'll see much information, many books which look at the mystical dimensions where actually they try to synthesize mm. much of the philosophy, the Vedic teachings, with that of the Islamic teachings. And it's unfortunate today that we've become more literalist. However, if you go back and see some of the great work that's being done or has been done, you'll come to realize that there was a time where these great religions lived together. Because for a wise man, for a holy man, he doesn't look at religion. He looks at God. When I see somebody, I should be seeing God in them. I should be seeing a reflection of God. And as Dr. Pandya said, and I was writing this down, unity, Unity is very important. We have a concept in Arabic known as ittihad, unity. And the same thing when he talked about equality, sacredness, and compassion. You know, compassion, when we look at it, rahma, compassion. The foundations of compassion actually begins with a mother. And as he says, mamta. You know, the mother is the root of compassion. And if you look at this universe, it was created on rahma which really Rahim is the womb of a mother in the Arabic language. So the entire universe is, it's just almost as if a mother gave birth. This entire universe is a womb and that womb encompasses compassion and mercy. And so the manifestation of this compassion and mercy is really found within creation. And so I think there's a huge scope. There's a necessity for us to do outreach with the right people, people on the same wavelength, and to discuss that, that which is important, that spiritual refinement. And when you refine, remember, when you change yourself, you're changing humanity. So if I can work just on myself to become better, the ramification will be that slowly but surely, humanity will stop becoming better. So yes, to answer your question in a short sentence, yes, it's important. We must outreach and we must do interfaith with everyone, not just Abrahamic faith or the Dharmic faith, but we all have to come together to interface for a better world. Mm. Dr. Pandya, I wanted to broach what is a somewhat tangential but still related topic of your work as a psychiatrist, having joined the Royal College of Psychiatry and being part of the West London Mental Health Trust, because what was just mentioned in the conversation there is the refinement of self. And so much of the conversation currently seems to be oriented around the pursuit of happiness when there are so many disorienting factors, as you mentioned, where social media is often a veil for 
intrinsic despair for sorrow as you broached earlier in the discussion. And I wanted to talk even about your espousal of alternative medicines like Ayurveda, naturopathy, Unani, Siddha, which are seen as incompatible with this scientific rigorous dialectic, which often accompanies psychiatry in the West. So I guess my question to both you, Dr. Pandya and the Imam, is the role of religion, faith and spirituality in curating your mental health, but equally in the mental health sciences, in refining the self in the same way that you mentioned, parallel to religion or integrated to religion? What does that dynamic look like to the both of you? Shall I answer first? After you. All right, then. Um, it's a wonderful question, Michael, I think, and, and more and more we are progressing uh, in this current century. More and more it becomes clearer to us that uh, besides like, you know, both science and spirituality we together, we thinking of a more holistic and, and integrated approach, there is no other way for the betterment of humanity. So if, for example, if we, if we look at the last century, if we try to do an analysis of the last century, from a very different perspective, at the beginning of the last century, we will find that there were three principal ideologies. Uh, there was one kind of philosophy which believed in a much more dictatorial, uh, authoritarian kind of point of view. And second was a more communist and, and socialist kind of model. And then third was a open market, liberalist, capitalist kind of ideology. And as the second world war ended, uh, the world, like you know, the first one was more, and the world war divided more or less between two principal ideologies, a, a communist one and a capitalist one. And then came the collapse of the Soviet Union, fall of the world war, and then like you know the the second was one too and and the prevalent economical model of the world became more or less capitalist. And then, then in the beginning of this century, we had 9-11 and economical crash of 2008. And then all of a sudden, the world was left with no predominant ideology. Nations and cultures and societies are not known because of their peculiar stem. Like you know, if you look at China, for example, it is communist, but probably more capitalist than any other country. So like, you know, the reason I'm sharing that with you is to remind ourselves that in the absence of a dominant ideology, at the moment, we are not deciding or we are not calling the nations because of their predominant, like, you know, standpoint. But in the absence of that, what became the global superpower is not a country, not Russia, China, America, or India. It's the superpower of today is science and technology. That's the field of information. So although my background is clinical and I've worked in my life for social service and spirituality, I would like, you know, if, if we look at the current situation, I would like to say that with this accelerating pace of technological advancement, uh, one thing interesting is happening. So because it is shaping the political system as well as the individual life's life choices, and, and one who controls the data controls the economy. And one who controls the economy controls the politics. And one who controls the politics is controlling you, me, and everyone else. Like, you know, like Heraclitus famously said, that if you are not interested in politics, does not mean politics is not interested in you. So, so the reason all, all that becomes important is because a revolution is taking place. If we think from a very philosophical point of view, it's taking place around us, from creation of the blockchain to the development of cryptocurrencies to the rise of artificial intelligence and artificial uh, consciousness to an automated world. But for the first time in the history, this is the important thing, for the first time in, in, in like in the history of the entire mankind, we are not part of that revolution. Like you know, in this fast-paced world of science and technology, human beings are slowly becoming irrelevant because we are not sure whether our existence is going to make any difference. Like, you know, this blockchain revolution, this automation would continue. But before, in the last century, whether whatever side I was standing, whether I was standing on this or the other side, rightly or wrongly, I believe that my involvement was going to make a difference in the future of the world. But this is the first time when people are like, you know, 
they're completely not sure whether whatever I'm doing is going to change anything. And so, like, you know, what is happening in, in this kind of situation, only two kinds of possibilities are there. Either complete chaos or like, you know, absolute annihilation would take place. So people would start to return back to their roots and start to find the reason, like, you know, why I should be there. And with this, like, you know, accelerated pace, what we see is that people are feeling more and more vacuum inside. Like, you know, already there is so much of growing tension, growing uncertainties within. It's not there because like, you know, for long we have been dreaming a dream from which we are just waking up. A, a dream that if we give just the money and like, you know, external satisfaction to the people, then everything would be happy. Everyone would be miraculously saved. And the real questions uh, that are there, they now start to emerge. Because once you like, you know, satisfy the reason for survival, then the question arises, the survival for what? Now people have means to live, but no meaning to live for. And the meaning is given by the spirituality. And the reason I'm saying it, like, you know, when you look at the approaches like yoga, we just had the international yoga day two days ago. These are the real questions that these disciplines are trying to fulfill. And both are needed. Like, you know, when we look at the current times when people have got so much of stress for no reason, so much of tension, then a comprehensive model is required where both science and spirituality, modern medicine practices and, and alternative medicine practices, they can work together to create something valuable for the future and uh, betterment for them. Thank you so much for those remarks. And Imam, from your perspective then, where do you think religion lies in this dialectic between, as Dr. Pandya so aptly explains, the development exogenously that occurs in society and that further isolates the human being from the process of development and spirituality in and of itself, metaphysical being as an end, as she is and aspires towards. How does religion contextualize these difficulties that we now encounter? And what role do you think it plays in this dynamic between scientific approaches to mental health, psychiatric approaches to mental health, and these more metaphysical approaches, which try to situate the human being in the first place before you deal with the worldly concerns which encumber them. So as far as mental health is concerned, it's not something which popped up one year ago or a decade ago. As long as human beings have existed, there have been similar problems. Where you find that there's a division between science and religion in the West, that's not the case within the East. And it's only until the last hundred years after the Second World War, where you find that Western culture has impinged upon the East, that we've seen a separation. But prior to that, there was really no separation. Science made as much sense as religion did. And in fact, for many, if you look at some of the most predominant scientists who came out from the East, you'll find them to be very religious people. In fact, if you look at the Enlightenment period, you look at your Enlightenment philosophers, they were all occultists. From Newton onwards, if you look at them, you'll find the one part of their life which is not discussed very openly is that side of their, their occult, that side where they were looking more into the spiritual or the metaphysical reality. And you find that with some of the greatest philosophers in the West, though they were pitching one type of a philosophy, but their personal life were very different. Their spiritual practices were very different. So has just been pointed out, look, we live in a time of confusion. We're probably the most affluent that we've been, right, as a world, in terms of the resources that we're using. But is it giving people peace? Just yesterday, there was a suicide that took place. A billionaire jumped off a building. And the question really is this, didn't he have everything in terms of material wealth? What leads a person to that? If science tells you the how, human beings are those individuals who want to know the why. If you look at a child, the child says, why, 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 why? And I believe it's religion that answers the why. That thing which is lacking within a human being, which is the whyness, to give you peace. Because if you look at the material world, what does it lead us to? If you're only looking at materialism, it leaves you very hollow. Some of the most successful material people have always come back to spirituality. If you look at some of the biggest, 
They always have a system. Some of the most successful people do wake up in the morning and meditate. Now, why is that? The mind is very complex, and I don't think science has actually reached the intricate details of the mind yet. But the one thing that I do know is that the remembrance of God, meditation and prayer, do give a human being peace. Otherwise, what you find is that in this darkness and confusion, what do people begin to suffer from? Anxiety. Caused by why? Why, is, why do people become unanxious? Why do people feel that life is slipping away from them? Why do they feel not in control? But if you look at all of these things, to not be in control, to be anxious, to be sad, not to be content, what gives you a sense of contentment? When you go and you help other people, you feel content. When you give food to a beggar, you feel content. Now, you may not know why, but there is a level of contentment. When you help somebody, you start feeling content. When you start studying and learning knowledge, actually start feeling content. When I read a book, I feel more content. What is it therefore? Therefore, the greatest knowledge that you can have is the knowledge of the absolute. Why? Because it gives you absolute. How do you gain the knowledge of the absolute? If it's just by reading books, I don't think it is because when you just read a text, it doesn't instill in your heart. It doesn't become a state of being. We know lying is bad, we've read it, but people still lie. Why? Because it's not a state of being. So therefore true knowledge becomes a state of being. And how does true knowledge become a state of being? Is when you start living that knowledge. How can you live that knowledge when you refine yourself and you strip yourself from all the negativity? And so therefore you find that the holistic way. And today, if you look at some of our psychiatrists, they also suggest meditation and prayer. The holistic way is more important, I think. I think the ability to be able to centralize your mind and your thoughts, to strengthen your mind, to submit, to submit to a higher entity. And even if you're not a religious person, even if you're an atheist, but you can still say that religion is a capsule, almost. That when a person feels out of control or feels that they're not in control and anxious, what do they do? Well, everything is to... When a religious person leaves everything to the absolute, let's say for argument's sake, even if there's no God, still gives you peace and removes uncertainty. So whether religion was devised by a very intelligent person thousands of years ago to give human being peace, it works because it does give humanity peace. And you may have seen in this COVID-19 period that actually in the West, having just been off some calls with the United Nations, you find that more people are turning to God. It's weird. In the United Kingdom, our congregations, be they Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Sikh or Muslim, have actually increased. Some congregations have doubled, some have tripled. But you know what's impressive? Online, people are coming who are not religious, but religion is giving them peace. So in trial and tribulation and times of difficulty, there's something in our DNA that goes towards God. And the living example is what you're seeing today. Yeah. I feel like there's so much that we could unpack from every perspective of this discussion, from how religion interacts with culture, how in and of itself, Shiism and the Gayatri Bariwa fraternity promote a form of self embellishment that exists not just in your exoteric presence, but in the esoteric, a refinement internally that's inward facing. There's so much more that I wish we could discuss, but I'm wary of everyone's time. So I wanted to thank Dr. Pandya for being our guest on the fourth World of Faith episode. I thank you for your thank remarks, you both your, of you. and your composure as well, uh, and, and the peace that hopefully it grants others. Thank you.